Hello and welcome back to It Happened Here. My name is Kate Thompson Davy. I'm a journalist in Cape Town, South Africa, and It Happened Here is my new baby project. It's a true crime podcast that attempts to approach these crimes through a very ethical and deliberate lens. I am re-giving that context because we have gained quite a lot of new listeners this week. And in fact, I've been really excited to see how many South Africans have been listening. Through the service that I use to host the podcast, I have access to some basic information about things like where listeners are based, or at least where their IP address is they're based. And until a couple of weeks ago, mostly my users were based in the UK and the US. And over the last couple of weeks, South Africans have completely taken over. And it's very exciting to see that. And I, I think it's directly linked to the fact that the Devil's Door documentary series about the Krugersdorp cult killings is having its moment. And I guess and I guess I'm getting some spillover of that excitement. People here um wanting to hear our own stories. So thank you to the South Africans who have come on board. I hope you stick around. I have an unbelievably long list of crimes that I want to get through because I think that, yes, it's horrific that we have such high crime statistics in this country, but these are stories that deserve to be told and understood, and I want to play a small role in doing that telling and doing that understanding. I have just a tiny bit of housekeeping to get through, and specifically, I have three new patrons to thank. And what was quite cool this week is that all three of the new patrons are actually people I know in real life. So, Melissa Leitner was um, in my year at school 7,000 or so years ago, and Melanie Kopke was also at school with us. Melanie has declared herself the podcast's biggest fan, and we have been chatting on social about theories and questions and ideas for future podcasts. So if you haven't uh, liked us or followed us on Instagram or Facebook, come along and please do so. I'd love to chat to you guys too, as I am currently enjoying the chat that I'm having with Melanie. Oh, and while I'm at it, a big hi to Melanie's mum. Melanie was telling me the other day how she had given her a gentle push to listen to the podcast. So hi, Mel's mom. Uh, also, my sister from another mister, Samantha Faree. I love you loads, Sam. So Melissa, Melanie, Samantha, thank you guys so much for supporting It Happened Here and for supporting me. It means the world to me. I've split this case into two parts because there is just so much to cover. And just a warning that... As always with true crime, there are descriptions of death and violence. And in the case that I'm going to be talking about today, specifically, there is discussion of sexual violence. So that is something to please bear in mind. If that's not for you, you know, do what you need to do to protect your heart. I also want to acknowledge a couple of narrative decisions I've taken here. This is my first serial killer in the pop culture sense of that word. And honestly, there will be more because, you know, this is the bread and butter of true crime podcasting. But it has really brought into sharp focus something that I had a sense of before, but haven't had to deal with firsthand, which is how weighted uh, or skewed the information that we have about the perpetrator is compared to the weight of information or the amount of information that we have about their victims. In both parts, I have to get through long series of body discoveries in which the newspaper coverage gives us very little to go on except for sometimes names and ages. And even then, there is a lot of disconnect between sources. So one publication might say that a victim was 12 and another says that they are 13 and on and on. I've tried to include victim family voices and any details I can where possible, but it's not a great reflection of our collective job as media in handling the coverage here. Then in both parts, but more in the second one, I will be talking about the psychology of 
of the perpetrator at length. But I will work very hard at keeping that informational in nature and not to fall into the trap of glorifying a murderer. I honestly don't think that there is anything to glorify. It's another one of those discussions that I see in true crime circles because, as I've said before, I'm obsessed and I listen to far too many true crime podcasts. So I know that people are talking about the ethics of using the names or monikers that these kinds of killers are given. So is it glorifying a perpetrator to call them, for example, the Zodiac? There is a case to be made for that, especially when these arseholes name themselves. Then there's also the narrative scholar in me who says that the term Zodiac is a signifier for more than one person or a series of crimes. It signifies an idea for a lot of people as well as a moment in time. It's also useful when there is uncertainty that the perpetrator is the person who was convicted or uh, uncertainty that someone acted alone. If we apply that thinking to this episode, I'm going to talk about the idea of the station strangler, the person who is associated with that name, and the meaning that that term had for people in a time and place. So with those debates swirling around my head, I'm going to commit to taking a very careful and deliberate decision per instance, but I wanted you to know why I have decided to use the term Station Strangler in this episode. And, you know, if you disagree with me, that's cool. Come do it. Uh, Come tell me what you think. Politely, please. (laughs) On social media, we can um, debate the merits of it as long as we keep everything, you know, polite and and friendly because no one wants to, to, well... Lots of people apparently want to fight with strangers online, but I don't. Um, So I'm very open to having the conversation. Come find me on Insta and Facebook. You can search for It Happened Here podcast on both of those platforms and you should be able to find us. Oh, one last thing, I swear. One last thing for international listeners. In South Africa, we use the term coloured for people of mixed race ethnicity, even generations down the line from the original so-called mixing. I know that that is considered a racial slur when it is used in the US, for example. And it isn't, I admit, a wholly unproblematic term here either. But in South Africa, it isn't a slur or slang. So please don't die of fright or horror when you hear me using that term during the course of this episode. Right, so, to the stories, IHHs. This is It Happened Here, Episode 10, The Station Strangler, One of Us. There's this long road I drive often into and out of Cape Town. It bypasses the city centre and many of the better-known and posher areas, and provides access to the southern peninsula area where I live. The road is called Baden-Powell, and it does this gentle undulation alongside the ocean for kilometres and kilometres, with one set of mountains in front of you and one behind you, and this stretch of low, flat landscape in between. On the one side is the ocean and sand dunes, and on the other side... More dunes, lots of low, scrubby greenery and and a lot of homes. It's desperately beautiful, and I use the word desperately quite intentionally. It is often utterly pummeled by wind, by rain or both. And when the wind gets up, the seagulls float above the dunes or hunker down into them, and it sounds like your car is being less than gently sandblasted. But it's not a pristine, natural space by any stretch of the imagination. There's plastic swirling in the sky with the gulls, and fishing line and detritus on the beach. There's just a single driving lane in either direction, and the sand often piles up on the road itself, giving the impression that it could disappear entirely with one big tide. There are large sections of the road where the human settlements crowd up just about onto the tarmac, homes made of salvaged metal and plastic. 
naturally it's a mix, right? There, there are some nicer houses, nicer streets. There is some industry, but overall, it's an area marked by poverty, an area that feels ramshackle and neglected, because it is. These stretches of dunes adjacent to Mitchell's Plain became a killing ground for a particular type of predator back in the late 80s and early 90s. This case unfolds at a critical and tense juncture in our history. The majority of events here take place between 1986 and 1995, the last few years of apartheid and then just after the dismantling of apartheid in our first election. And although the end of apartheid is absolutely a good thing, those were extremely tense years in the country for lots of different reasons. In the months leading up to our first ever national democratic elections, open to all South Africans for the first time, the communities living there were facing an additional stressor, a fear that wasn't political, as body after body began to turn up in the dunes in shallow, sandy graves. If you've listened to any of my earlier podcasts, you've probably noticed that I do spend quite a lot of time talking about places, locations where crime takes place or people are living or bodies are found. It was a decision that informed the podcast name, not the other way around. Because place, like time and culture and language, are the context in which these acts, all acts, happen. I feel that if we want true crime to be more than scary stories, this is the stuff that matters. This case really demonstrates that, so let's zoom out a little and give you the context for the area known as the Cape Flats. There's almost too much to be explained. I found myself quite paralyzed by the thought of trying to provide the necessary scaffolding to build the understanding on. I'd need to pull from history, sociology, economics, and more to do this explanation justice. And it's a lot, and a lot of it is outside of my wheelhouse. So I'm going to do the best summary I can while acknowledging that it is insufficient. Until about 60, 70 years ago, this place was largely not permanently settled by people. Then the apartheid government started to carve up the country into patches of land and declared that each patch would be occupied by specific races. They outlawed living and owning land in the city for people who were not white, which meant evicting people from their homes, and many of the displaced people were moved to this flat stretch. The apartheid government took thousands of black and brown people out of their family homes, stripped them of this generational wealth and housing asset, and corralled them into this area that was far from jobs and genuinely inhospitable because the ground is so sandy and shifting. It's also prone to fires and floods. The physical and social elements combined are why this area has frequently been called apartheid's dumping ground. It's an awful term, I know, but it highlights how some people felt about their economic and location displacement. And the effects are still in play today, as I've explained in previous episodes. There are many neighborhoods that fall under this term. Mitchell's Plain is one such neighborhood, and the backdrop to much of this case, as is a neighboring town called Strand, and several nodes in between the two. There is a limited commuter train system here that was designed not for comfort or convenience, but to connect working people with their workplaces while shutting them out of the cities and suburbs that were largely white. And it was also used by a killer to access his victims. Only one man has ever been convicted of any crime associated with this spate of murders, although there is a lot of speculation that he wasn't the only perpetrator. The fact that he was a coloured man living in a coloured community, the fact that he was a teacher at a local school, a primary school, the fact that the death penalty had been abolished just a week or so before his sentencing, all of these combined make this a case of such horror 
and cultural significance in South Africa that for many of us, the dunes and the train stations here will always carry a taint of association. On September 30th, 1986, Jonathan Clarson and his friend Peter got on a train. When Peter, who was only 12, realized they were going in the wrong direction, he decided to get off, and he left Jonathan, who was 14, behind on the train. But he would never see his friend again. Jonathan was missing for three days before his body was found near Mordedam Station in Belleville South. He was found in a stage of advanced decomposition, so the full picture of what Jonathan went through and when is hard to grasp. But investigators believe that it was a body dump site rather than the site of the murder. A little later that year, on December 29th, Yusuf Hoffman and a friend Elton boarded the train to make their way to the beach. Remember, we have our big summer holidays at that time of the year, December, in the Southern Hemisphere. Yusuf's friends will later recall how they were approached by a man on the train who claimed to be looking for his little brother. He said that the man befriended them and that Yusuf went along to help him, but he would never come home. His body was found in a sewer in Rocklands near baden Powell Drive over a week later on January 7th, 1987. Another group of boys would tell an eerily similar story of heading to the beach on the trains on January 5th. They were playing in the dunes when they were approached by an unknown man who chatted to them and offered them bread. Mario Thomas was one of those boys. His age is reported as both 11 and 13 in newspapers, but it seems that the consensus is that he was 11. Mario goes along to help the stranger, and his older brother stays behind. That night, when he comes home alone, their parents are worried, but hoping that he had gone to a friend's house or family. Of course, that stress begins to grow as they don't hear from him, and the brother begins to get more and more distraught as the days go by. Eventually, he goes to his parents with the truth about that day, but no one is able to find any sign of Mario until almost three weeks later, when his little body is found in a field in Kales River on January 24th. In both these cases, the perpetrator is unknown, but this ruse of a grown man needing help from young boys will be sending alarm bells clanging for true crime fans. On April 9th, 1987, the body of an unidentified boy is found in some bushes near Modderdam Station, His face was buried in the sand and his hands had been tied behind his back with a belt. He was severely decomposed and would never be identified. He was found with his shoes placed neatly next to the body, something we will see again. In fact, this sign uh, of being undressed and redressed is something that we will see with most of the boys. Additionally, we see that many of the victims were strangled with a piece of their own clothing. On January 25th, 12-year-old Freddy Cleves has been playing with his friends when he's approached by a man who asked him to come help him sell fruit in exchange for some money. Freddy's body was found the next day, June 26th, in some bushes near the Bellhar railway line. On August 24th, Samuel Nakaba would be declared the fifth victim that year, the sixth tied to the same killer. Samuel was 15 when he was last seen at a bus stop where he had been waiting with his sisters. Witnesses to his disappearance say he was approached by a man in an olive green Chrysler Valiant and that he got into the car willingly. He waved goodbye to his sisters from the car as they drove off. The alarm was raised when he failed to meet his mom at the Belleville train station after school. His body would be found in the bushes near Waterdam Station on August 25th with one of his shoes quite deliberately positioned next to him, like the unidentified boy from April. 
My friend Natasha Joseph is an excellent journalist from a family of journalists, and a few years ago, she began researching a book on this case. She has since decided not to pursue the book project, but she does have an incredible amount of research and news clippings, which she kindly made available to me for this podcast. What has been remarkable about that is that I've been able to track the news and public perception of this case. So, for example, at this stage, in August 1988, the police and news have all linked these cases, and there are even witness identikits being published. I'm going to share some of those pics um, of the clippings on Instagram and Facebook, so please go have a look, and I will share the identikit um, clippings as well. They show a relatively light-skinned man with an inch or two of Afro-style hair, a long, thin nose, and glasses. Off the back of that quite extensive coverage, there is already a sense of growing panic and vigilance from the community. For example, there's an instance of an apparent attempted abduction at a train station in September, reported by a woman who says she was alarmed to see someone who looked exactly like the published identikit talking to a young boy at the station. When she approaches the pair, the man makes a hasty exit, and a few moments later, the boy runs off too. There's no way, of course, to link this directly, but I do think that there are likely loads of abduction attempts, and perhaps even successful ones, that we simply do not know of. For example, years later, in 2005, a man came forward to say that he believed he had been an intended murder victim of the Strangler, back in August 1986, which is just a month or so before Jonathan Clarsons is murdered. This man tells of being abducted with a friend. Specifically, he says that they were initially offered money by the stranger to help him carry some boxes, which is part of the MO that emerges more clearly in later crimes. The man gets around behind them, restrains them, and marches them into the felt near Philippi, There, he says, both he and his friend were raped and strangled during the rape, but that they managed to slip their restraints when their their attacker fell asleep after the assault. He was 33 when he came forward and 14 at the time of the assault. He came forward alone and declined to name his friend and fellow victim for all the obvious reasons. 2005 is an interesting year for this case. There's a renewal in interest, but I will get to some of the details of that in the second part. For now, it's interesting to note that this man says that he and his friend knew Norman Simons at the time. That's the man who, the only man who is convicted of anything to do with these killings. They knew him and they say that he was not the man who assaulted them. Something else to note here, it seems as if most, if not all of the victims linked to this case were raped. But this is in a time in South Africa before a much-needed modernization of the law around the crime of rape. Under the old law, sodomy, as it is termed, was a separate crime from rape, which had a very limited definition. I have chosen to call these crimes what they were, rape. It's not the first or last time that South Africa's very conservative views on homosexuality around around the time of these crimes colors or skews the reporting on them. Back in 1987, on October 1st, the body of another unidentified boy, approximately 14 years old, is found near Morderdam Station, same location as the first victim's body. I mean, same exact location. He was so badly decomposed that facial reconstruction experts were brought in to try help them identify him, but sadly, he's never identified. If you've not been keeping count... This is the seventh victim and the fourth found right near Mortadam Station. As I said, by this stage, the link between the murders is well established. The papers have started nicknaming the killer, including the Cape Flats Maniac and the Maniac Strangler. But it is the name of the station strangler that sticks. We've already spoken about my hesitancy on the naming business, but if you're going to go with a name, I'm glad they went with something that didn't involve the word maniac. 
A police task force is up and running, and according to press, they were investigating and ruling out suspects in September 1987 already. But around the same time, a lot of the papers seemed to be reporting that detectives also believed there might be a gang link. This area of Cape Town has been plagued by gang violence, and it is something I want to talk about at length, but perhaps not for this episode. There's no real indication that a strong link to gang members was ever established. Also, quite interesting to me, when I started pawing or pouring or both of those through the news cuttings from Tash, was the fact that there are already a number of psychological profiles and psychology professionals being quoted in the reportage. They all talk about a quiet loner, probably someone who blends into the community, which is to suggest that he is also coloured. They also talk about someone struggling with their homosexuality, which we know today is the paint-by-numbers version of serial killer profiling. I'm not saying that there's no value in these early profiles at all, and profiler Mickey Pistorius will later be absolutely influential in the investigation, but the media academic in me was a little alarmed by how casually terms like sex maniac or sex killer or homosexual crop up in the headlines in the late 80s as if they are common sense or or worse synonyms. Just over a month into 1988, another victim is linked to the case, Calvin Spears. Calvin was in Standard 1 at Matrusburg Primary, which would be grade 3 today, and I have no idea what the equivalent is in the US or UK, but he was just 9 years old. Calvin is one of the few victims who I was able to find some solid personal information on. His parents and teachers are quoted in the media, so we do get a sense of who this little guy was. He was a middle child, with an older sister, Roslyn, and little brother, Donovan. His teachers describe a lovable, if mischievous kid, but they point out that whenever he was naughty, he did try and make up for it. He apparently liked school and hadn't missed a day all year. He was outgoing and quite independent, and we can see that in the circumstances, unfortunately, that led to his death. His mom, Anne James, told the papers that he had begged to go with a friend and that friend's parent to the station to sell fruit and veg at a stall just outside. They used to do this to help out and, of course, earn a little bit of what South Africans call pocket money. This is not a rich community, so a few cents of your own to spend on sweets would have been a considerable draw card to these kids. Just after 6pm, she was closing up for the day and told the boys to go get the train home. But in the after-work crush, the boys got separated and Calvin didn't make it home. He was found on February 8th, 1988, just 900 metres, or about half a mile, from the station in a field. This is one of the few victims that we know police were able to get serological samples from, and that these were tested, but they were not a match for the man who is today considered the killer. Something about Calvin's death really pushes the anger and fear and frustration into overdrive, probably because he was so young. News coverage at the time talks about the police fielding some 700 tips from the public, interviewing and excluding 600 people. The Cape Times reports that a, quote, mob of people began stoning a vehicle in Calvin's funeral procession because they believed that a man inside looked like the identikit sketch they'd seen. He was Calvin's cousin, on his way to mourn, and there was never any further link or suspicion that he was involved in Calvin's death. Around the same time, a 14-year-old and his friend wander into the police station one day with a tale of escaping an attempted abduction but getting away, but unfortunately this is ultimately dismissed as a fake. In May, the news broke that a 31-year-old had been arrested, but almost as quickly ruled out and released. In July, the news reports again on the case of 22-year-old David Kruger, who pleads guilty to strangling a boy to death with his belt in March, but denies that he raped his victim, and it seems they aren't able to make any further links between him and the strangler victims. 
The case is also starting to get political attention. A spokesperson from the United Democratic Front, or UDF, tells the press that the police would be doing more if these were white children disappearing, and it's hard to argue with that. There was also, shockingly, a failed police action that actually ended in the death of a suspect. This was not something I'd read online, and I only found it in Tasha's clippings. It seems police had a man under observation, but something went wrong, and he came face to face with a policeman, and he pulled a weapon on them. The policeman shot the man in self-defense. He was 37-year-old Franklin Bester, and there is some se- some evidence to suggest that he had gang associations, but certainly no strong links to the Strangler case that I can tease out. The name Station Strangler is now the main one in use, and the reward stands at about 12,000 rand, which would be something like 100,000 rand today. It's a lot of money, but not Lotto Millions money. And we are two years and eight deaths into this case that would ultimately grow to include at least 22 victims. In 1989, there is one further missing boy linked to the case, and that's Denver Gaza. 11-year-old Denver, however, had been missing since November 1987, when he and his friends had accepted the offer of a stranger to buy them Gatsby's, which or a local takeaway sub or sandwich of truly epic proportions. No wonder they were tempted. The boys headed into the shop with the money, and Denver stayed in the car with the stranger. When his mates came back, Denver and the man and the car were all gone, and his body was only found 18 months later. There are no confirmed cases linked to this in 1990 or 1991. But I did find a very interesting news clipping about the investigation specifically. Eustace Winston Martin had been arrested under suspicion of being the strangler, but it seems this arrest was so poorly handled and the case against him so flimsy that he actually successfully sued for damages. This is at least the fourth man who is linked in press as a possible suspect at this stage. I'm sure there were a lot more, but I do find it interesting that within a few years, it seems that everyone forgets that the man who goes down for this wasn't actually the only person considered. It, it, it might be worthwhile stating here that I am not about to launch a defense of Norman Simons, not at all. I'm just laying out the facts and details I can find for you, and then we're going to go through it all in greater length next time. But I have to say, at this point... I am beginning to harbour the suspicion that there was a partner or at least copycat killers operating at the same time. This gap, though, in linked cases gave people in the various affected communities a chance to catch their breath. But in October 1992, a boy is taken with an MO so textbook like the others that the police and newspapers are forced to concede We are not free of the menace yet. On October 23rd, 11-year-old Jakubus Lowe is playing video games at an arcade with his friends when a man came in and offered them money to help him sell vegetables. Jakubus agreed and was last seen getting on a train with the man. Five days later, his body was found. According to police, he was killed within 12 hours of his body being found meaning that he had been kept somewhere for the intervening days before his body was unceremoniously dumped in the dunes near Imnandi Beach, right back where the story began. But that is all I have for you this week. Next week, there are a lot more murders to get through, as well as identifying the suspect and interrogating him and at least two confessions that are written out and retracted, and a court case and the aftermath. Please check out the linked sources and come give us a like or follow on Instagram and Facebook. My name is Kate Thompson-Davey, and this has been a Ready Freddy production. (laughs) 